All right, welcome everyone back to day two of uh, new user training and Perlmutter best practices here at NURSE. Uh, I'm Charles Lively again, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, Lippi Gupta and Eric Palmer. And today we'll continue on with learning about some best practices on working on Perlmutter at NURSE and NURSE resources. Uh, before we get started, did we have any questions or um, follow-up thoughts from our day one session yesterday? Okay, now if you if you do have any questions, please do remember that you'll have access to the Q&A doc um, until tomorrow to submit any questions that you might have. And we will, of course, follow up and respond to any questions. And we do publish the Q&A doc. Uh, all personal identifying information is uh, re redacted. And we post that on the event page. But uh, today, we will continue on with learning about uh, our programming environment and compilation environments on Perlmutter, uh, running jobs, as well as using Jupyter Notebooks. And to kick things off, we have Eric Palmer. Eric, if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself and get started, have yeah. at it. All right, thanks, Charles. Um, so before I do the whole screen share, um, I'll just start with that. I'll just say, uh, hi, my name is Eric Palmer. Uh, I'm a software integration engineer uh, here at NERSC. I work in the programming environments and models group. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, programming environments and compiling code. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen in sort of dual terminal slide mode. <laughs> um, but can you read this or should it be bigger? Are we okay with the size of the terminal text? It's my first question. Okay. It looks pretty good to me. Um, I mean, it could be a little bit bigger, but I mean, I can see it. So it's up to you. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's great. Bigger Thank again. You. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to tell people is today I'm really going to do more of a live demo style of presentation. Uh, so you're going to kind of see me uh, trying to do stuff on the fly and make all the mistakes that I normally make uh, rather than sort of a slide heavy presentation that uh, some of the new user trainings have been done in the past as. And I wanna point out that if you really like slides and you want to see a lot of slides with a lot of information, um, it's good. Uh, there, if you look at the past training from June, um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is fairly similar uh, to what was done in June. So if you want to go back and see that slide and that presentation, that's going to be a different style if you prefer uh, sort of that slide heavy uh, style of presentation that's available to you. Uh, but today, um, I'm going to talk about what you do or what happens after you log in. So we've logged into Perlmutter. Oh, OK. I may have to, ah, all right, well, I'll work with it. It's a little bit too big for me now. But anyways, um, the slides, I think Charles made those available. Are they in the chat? That way, if it, maybe if the word's a little bit too small, um, you, can, you can read it there. But to be honest, I'm going to really be focusing on the live demo part, and the slides are going to be really tangential to, to what's going on. Um, but the main point here is, You've logged into Perlmutter, you want to do your work, uh, how do you do that? And the answer is usually you do it with your software. And so then the question then becomes is how do you get to the software you want on the system? And there's sort of four main ways of doing that. One is loading modules, which is a way to configure your environment to get the software you want uh, based off of software that's already been installed in the system by people, people like me. Uh, another one is containers. Uh, another one is compiling from source, which is sort of like you clone a Git repo or download some software or download some code uh, from the internet. Now you have to compile it so it'll run on our system. And then a fourth option is package managers like Conda, SPAC, and, and E4S, uh, which do that sort of find and uh, help you build and compile the code. Um, but today, what I'm really going to focus is on, on is loading modules and compiling the code from source. So... The first thing uh, you're going to encounter with Perlmutter is modules. 
And so when you log into the system, you're going to get a, sort of a default setup. And you will find out that if you chase Python and you type version, you're going to see the default version of Python in our system is Python 2.7.18. And probably for most of you, if you're using Python in your work, 2.7 is, is too old. <laughs> so the question then becomes is like, well, uh, how can I get a newer version of Python on the system? You know, do I need to make a help ticket? And the answer is, is no. We, the, what is configuring this are the modules that are loaded on the system. And so if I type module list, I can see a list of the modules that are available in the system. And this is the default list, uh, the, what you start with when you sign on without doing any modifications. Now, available to me is a newer version of Python. And all I need to do to find it is to say module load Python. And in this case, uh, I'm looking for version 3.11. I already know it's on the system, so I'm not going to go through the process of finding it right now. But I'm just going to type module load Python 3.11. It's going to actually do a few more things I won't mention right now, but I'm sure they're going to talk about when we discuss Python later. But now you're going to see on my list of loaded modules, I now have this Python 3.11. And what that's done is it's made some modifications to my environment. So now if I type the same Python command, Python dash version, I get Python 3.11 dash 11. So the point of modules is to get the software that you need for your work uh, into your environment, into your system. So um, that's what they're doing. We saw our list of what it's uh, loaded by default. So let me now unload the Python one just because it's going to take up a little bit of space on the screen. Uh, I need to type module unload Python. And I'll be back to default list. Right, so we start with these 15 modules. I just want to point out that the, these modules do things to your environment um, in useful ways. Uh, the first one is sort of includes sort of optimizations for the CPU. Um, LibFabric, Cray and Pitch deal with the MPI. This Cray LibSci deals with all sorts of math libraries that are optimized to work for our HPE system. Um, CUDA Toolkit, Cray Excel NVIDIA, GPU, those are all connected to uh, the GPU architecture and, and uh, configuring things so that your code runs uh, with the GPUs on our system. So, so the point is, is like, if you log in and the first thing you do is take out all the modules, you're going to be fighting sort of an uphill battle uh, trying to get things to work. So there's a reason why we kind of start with these set of defaults, uh, and they do they do and will make your life better and easier. I promise you. So so please um, consider keeping them. All right. So uh, commands for modules and how to work with them. So module list you've already seen. This shows you what's what modules are currently loaded in your environment, and so these are what are responsible for configuring the environment the way it is. Uh, I've already showed you module load. Uh, with Python, right, to load a module. And I also showed you how to unload a module with module unload Python. Right. Uh, another one that can be helpful is module help. Right. So the example I want to use is I think Berkeley GW. Yeah, so if I'm looking at these modules, I want to learn a little bit more about what this module is. I can type module help. This is giving me the module help for specifically the Berkeley GW one. Um, Berkeley, Berkeley GW-4.0 GPU version. So um, the point is, is that there may be several options for the Berkeley GW uh, module. Um, available, and they might have different helps. So you could depend, depending on which one you want. And, and to make this list, I'm just typing tab to do the tab completion. Um, but you can call up help for any one of these just by specifying the full name, right? So um, I can tell you that the help in the module files tend to be written by the engineers themselves. So some of them, like this one here, is a pretty good one that tells you where it is and where to find more information, and this one doesn't give you much, but we are working to make that uh, more uniform and better overall. But uh, I would still think it's worth telling people uh, that the help is available that way. 
Uh, if you're still having trouble with the modules, um, module help with nothing, we'll tell you a little bit about how to use the module commands, right? And bring up the other commands you can use in other stuff. So uh, it's good to know about. And in that same vein, the ultimate source of truth is always the manual. So if you type man module, you'll get an even more extensive list of all the options and things available. So uh, if you want to learn everything about it, it's there. Another command too that I think is important is module show. And I'm gonna use create HDF5 as this example, because this is showing you what happens when you load the module into your environment. So when I type that module load command, it is actually gonna run all these commands here, 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 and so on, right? And what most of these commands are, and for most of the modules, they're gonna be similar, is they're gonna be setting environment variables Right, so this one is going to pick this variable PEHDF5 config libraries, and it's going to set it to here for this value. Some of them are going to be prepending the path, right? So it's going to add these places uh, to your path, right? So that when you are looking um, for executables, it's also now going to look in this op create PEHD5 1.12.29 bin uh, for those things, so it can find the things that it wants. So this is how modules um, modify the system you're using uh, and, and sort of change how it behaves so you get the software you want. OK, so let me, I'm getting heading backwards. So we've seen module list, load and unload, help and show. And then the last one, uh, I'm going to do sort of a whole thing about why you want to use module spider uh, instead of module avail, which you may have seen in many other places. So let's get into that. All right. So uh, I'll put module, I'm going to type module avail, and I'm going to show you why I didn't include this so much on my list. Um, but what module available does is it gives you a list of the modules you can load based off of the modules you already have loaded in already have loaded. So our module system is hierarchical, which means it only displays as available what is available based off of what you have. So sometimes you miss something. So in this example, what I'm going to be looking for is I've got, so this is what I type, I type module available, and I've got a long list of all the possible modules I can load based off the modules I have loaded now. Um, but what I'm actually looking for in this example is to load Cray net CDF. And if I start at the bottom, I won't find anything. Um, if I go down, oh, let's see if I can, let's just type net CDF. See if it shows up there, okay. So if I search these, this Cray available uh, output, I'm gonna find one Cray parallel net CDF, but that's not actually the one I want. Um, and if I go going through this, I'm not gonna find any more. So that's the only one. So you might get the impression that that's the only uh, NetCDF module available. However, if instead I'm using module spider, create right, NetCDF, or even better, because I know I want NetCDF, I don't know the name, um, module spider, NetCDF, I'm going to get a list of all the other, all the modules that are available in the system. All right? So I've got these. This one with the Cray net CDF, parallel net CDF. I've got the HDF5 parallel. Uh, what am I getting up to? Uh, net CDF HDF5 parallel. And I've got Cray net CDF, right? If I were to just do module available Cray net CDF, I get the same, I get a message like this, right? It doesn't find the module because based off the modules I have loaded right now, I can't I'll just load it right away. I have to do this intermediate step. But if I type module spider create netcdf, it's actually going to start to tell me useful information. So if I read through this, it's going to say, try using the exact version in typing spider again. So I'll do that. And then that's going to give me some specific information that says you will need to load some modules from this list 
uh, to be able to load CreateNet CDF. And if I look at this list carefully, it's basically telling me that I need to load Create HDF5. So now if I do module load Create HDF5, right? I brought Create HDF5 into my system. If I type things like module available, Create Net CDF, now it's going to tell me like, oh, of course, the one you want was here all along, if only you had loaded HDF5 first, right? Which is not always very helpful. It's much nicer to use Spider to figure that out. So now I can just do module load, pray in a TDF, get my list, and now I have the module uh, I wanted loaded. Um, so this is the big reason why when you're looking for software, it's okay to sort of browse through this module avail and see, but but know that if there's a, something that you know is out there that, or you're looking for something else, uh, you might not find everything that way. And that module spider will instead um, traverse the entire list and tell you everything that's available, uh, even if you can't, even if you have to load something else before you load the next module. Um, okay. So that's kind of my my spiel about modules. Uh, we talked about what happens when you load a module to change your environment. Uh, and the next thing I want to do is basically say is how to do some some code compile examples. Um, but let me just take a breath right here. Uh, are there any questions about the modules of that I can answer right now or show something that you might want to see? Um, uh, hello. Yes. Uh, hi, this is uh, Brad Dune. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. So uh, what if we have loaded a module using uh, module load, the command, but mm -hmm. we have also installed, uh, let's say a Python uh, library in our, like, you know, user, you know, you can do pip install user, right? I mean, it has been recommended that we use, we do this in environments, but let's say in an environment, I have it installed. And uh, let's say like I have a PyTorch version X there, and but I load a PyTorch, let's say version Y here, right? So then they are conflicting. So then which one will it be using? Yeah, so I'm gonna tell you how I'd figure that out, right? So if I'm looking for PyTorch, right? So if uh, I'm gonna do this module show and I'm gonna look and see, well, we can just use the default one for now. Um, but by doing this module show, you can I can see how this is modifying my environment, right? So what it's using is this Python user base environmental variable to set the location of where it's going, right? It's also including this location in your path. So now when you are looking for the commands that are in this, let me see what commands, because I'm not super familiar with PyTorch, um, but I can look in here and see. Mm, sorry, I needed one more slash, I think. Right, if I'm looking for executables like these ones that PyTorch uses, then it's gonna start using these ones here from this directory. So you, you talked about you'll get a conflict, but the way that conflict is gonna show up is based off of which path it's pulling which one from. And so the way you resolve that conflict is to make sure the path is clear. Um, now, I don't think you're ever gonna run into this situation because when we talk about Python, we're gonna talk about how to set up the environment and pull in the things you want so you don't run into this situation. But but if you ever did, the way you could sort it out is by looking at how the module is affecting your environment and then know how your install affects your environment in resolving the two. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sure, you know, if there's more questions, please feel free to use the Q&A. Um, and I'm gonna keep uh, demonstrating stuff. So let me see, what did I call this? Okay. So what I wanna do next is do some code compilation examples. Um, 
So the, the background here is uh, what's the difference between compiling code on the machine you have now at home and the machine in Perlmutter? Um, essentially, on your own computer, you may have done just like GCC uh, for hello, like here in this first example, this hello world dash C uh, to compile a code. And you'd get code out, but it would not be MPI enabled code. Uh, if you, the next step up from there is like maybe you're working on a cluster that has, you know, multiple nodes on it. So you need to use MPI. And typically you install some version of MPI and that includes a wrapper, right? So that when you compile your code, instead of using GCC now, you would use MPI CC. And that would sort of cook in all the MPI libraries that you need into your code so that when you run Hello World, it's now MPNI enabled uh, Hello World code provided, you know, the MPI commands are in the code. Um, and so then you get sort of a code with more capabilities. When you move to Perlmutter, we have the HPE uh, programming environment. And what that does is it includes a lot of sort of optimizations and, and, and flags and switches to make things run as best as they can. But also it uses our specific version of MPI that's designed for our system um, to make things work uh, when sometimes they won't work uh, otherwise. So we definitely recommend that you get in the habit of sort of combining the programming environment that you're in with these compiler wrappers. So at home, GCC, at your cluster somewhere else with MPI, you might be using MPI CC. On Perlmutter, you're going to be looking for things that are called, it's going to be lowercase cc for C, uppercase cc for C++, uh, FTN for Fortran, um, and that's what we're going to look to use to compile our code to get the full sort of optimization and uh, capabilities out of it. So um, let me start by just doing some examples. Uh, if you're on Perlmutter, you probably want to compile sort of MPI enabled code. So uh, because we have a large system with lots of nodes, you want to take advantage of that. Uh, so I think these sort of examples with just hello world from different uh, nodes is a good place to start uh, to make sure you're getting things working correctly. Um, so this is most, I think this has this one, I was able to fit the whole one on the slide. Um, but what I want to show you is how difficult and complex it is to, and let me, just because I like to start from, um, okay. Let me pick these out because, like I said, I don't. I want to start from sort of the default environment. And you can see here, I have the GNU environment set up here. Um, so, um, so what I want to show you here is this example with the Hello World. Uh, MPI enable code. And so essentially I have a code here, uh, which you see here. If I write it to the screen with cat, it you can see that the code here is the same as what you see over here. Right. And the way I compile it is I'm going to use capital CC to get to my C compiler. I'm going to type the name of the source code and I'm just going to change the output name to hello.mpi. And just like that, I've now compiled MPI enabled code that is optimized to run on Perlmutter. We'll do all the best, fanciest things possible. Uh, and it was just as simple as using capital CC. So um, I think that's pretty cool, right? So the the this HPE programming environment essentially makes it easy to compile optimized code uh, for our system. Uh, if I want to run this code, just so we can see that everything actually worked, I need to grab a node. I think I can do that. Oh, good. Looks like it's going quickly. OK, so now I can run this. Let's run four. That tells us how many MPI ranks to use. And we'll hear more about this when you run your jobs. But you can see I'm getting a little world from each one of my MPI ranks here. OK. 
next example is now I'm going to say, well, you know, MPI ranks are nice, but I want even more parallelism with OpenMP. So what does that look like when I'm compiling something? Um, I've got MPI, OpenMP example. Same thing. I'm going to show you that it's actually the code that you see here uh, is the code you see here, except, you know, some of this, it couldn't fit on the slide. Um, the similar thing, right? I'm going to look to use the Craig compiler wrapper. So in this case, I'm compiling C code. So I'm going to use lowercase cc. And because I want to do open MP threaded parallelism, I'm going to include f open MP. And then it's a compiler fly I need to include to enable that. And then let me call it hello hybrid. Call it hello hybrid. So we're going to see that compiled without any problems. The next thing I need to do to run OpenMP code is to remember all these OpenMP variables I need to set. And the only one I ever remember is OpenMP number of threads. And I'm just going to use two for now. But where I look when I forget these things is in the our docs. And there's this place called you know running jobs, example jobs, and example job strips. And I just kind of like go through here until I find the one I want. Uh, and I know here that this, if it says export OpenMP num threads and OpenMP places, Brockbind, this is the one, the example that I want to follow. So that's how I remember those things when I forget them. Find, I need to set each one of these uh, before I can run an OpenMPI code. And now if I've done all those and I type S run, and I will keep it too, so this stay short. If I run my hello hybrid code. Ah, so now I've got no, okay. So now I'm getting my two MPI ranks, one and zero, but each one of them has two threads each, like we specified here. And so we can see that that code compiled and it's working the way we want. Um, and again, like uh, the only difference between the first example is that we added the right the f open MP flag to enable uh, open MP parallelism. If you didn't know about that flag, you would look possibly in uh, the manual for the compiler will tell you basically uh, about all the flags you ever wanted to know about. You can search this, um, open MP, sure, I don't believe you. That's open MP, right? It will tell you, see it right here, if I include this dash F open MP, enable handling open MP directives, and whatnot. So um, I just want to point that out because if you, or wondering what some of these flags do like that the the manual has supposed to have every single one uh, so if you ever want to read more know more about what's going on then then that's a good place to go okay uh i've done two examples so far i hope you're getting the sense that using the create compiler wrappers is uh what you want to do uh, it also makes things uh pretty simple when we're just compiling you know a single code but I want to do a slightly more complex example with CUDA aware MPI. Um, let me go back to my slides here. So um, without going too deeply into it, the difference between regular MPI and CUDA aware MPI is now instead of just the CPU talking to or sending messages from one CPU to another, now we want the GPUs to also be able to send messages directly from one to another without having to go to the CPU. Uh, so this gives you sort of like uh, more performance, essentially. Um, and to make this work, again, we're going to use the create compiler wrappers because it's going to do a lot of stuff in the background that just makes it simple for us. Um, but the first thing we need to do is look at our environment and make sure we're configuring it correctly. So right now, um, I'm going to do compile some CUDA code. So if you look here, let's see. This B casting device is my example. 
sorry. But if you look here, I've got this CUDA mem copy, copy thing, CUDA malloc. These are these are CUDA uh, code commands that I need to um, that I'm going to need a CUDA compiler for. So to compile CUDA code, I'm going to use the NVIDIA programming environment. So I'm going to load that. Uh, and then the other thing to point out is if you want CUDA aware MPI, what you're looking for is this GPU module loaded. It's loaded by default. Um, you can uh, module load CPU and it, and it will remove it, right? So it'll replace it, the GPU with CPU. So you, if you now decide you don't want CUDA aware MPI for your code for whatever reason, you can compile it in this configuration, right, with these modules, and you won't get CUDA aware MPI. But for this example, because we do want it, we're going to make sure that that GPU module is loaded. Right. So now you see I have programming environment NVIDIA for CUDA code. I went uh, CUDA aware MPI, so I make sure that GPU module is there. And now um, I'm doing C code, so I'm using lowercase c. Nice. I compile my code. Um, what, oh, oops. Thank you, error message. <laughs> um, so we're getting this warning. Um, notice that, first of all, it's just a warning, and it's not necessarily an error. So it's something we should be aware of. But if our code seems to be running correctly, then, then we don't necessarily have to worry about it too much. Um, this particular error is something sort of going on deeper within the system, which we're aware of we need to work out. So, um, but for now we can ignore it. So I've compiled my code. Um, the next thing I need to do is to run it. I need to tell it how many ranks I want to run with MPI ranks again. I need to also tell it how many GPUs, because now we're doing GPU enabled code. Um, and then I can call my code. And what we're going to see, uh, this runs quickly, is that now I'm getting, I have you know my four ranks of MPI. Uh, what it's doing is it's sending the value from one rank to the other three. The other three started at negative one, and then they all became 42 when they received it from the first one. So this is an example of CUDA aware MPI code um, working. Uh, but again, like a lot of things were done by just using the Cray compiler wrappers and having the module modules configured in the way we needed it, right? So this slide over here just drives on that part. Um, this is just a table again with some of the uh, some of the compilers. So if you want to find out, like I pulled up that manual file for the GNU uh, programming environment it was here for uh, NVIDIA it uses the MVC compiler, so you can find it by doing this one. And so on, and then these are some of the flags. But but again, like I'm going to leave this here for you if you want to see that. Uh, that's available, but it's also in our docs at these links here. Um, so yes, okay. So the other thing I just wanted to quickly show everyone is what exactly is going on, right? Um, and how can I see what's going on? So. Uh, again, let me just make sure I'm still in programming environment NVIDIA. Um, okay, I'll go back to the other one just because um, I like I like defaults, I guess. Okay. So a fancy thing I can do is I can include this create PE verbose flag in my compile line. And so this is really this really is just a hello world code. Right, it doesn't it doesn't do anything else. But now I'm asking, adding this dash cray pe verbose line, and you see, my compile line instead of being cc has now become a call to G plus plus. Right, and then it's added all these extra compiler flags. Where where in our most complicated example a second ago we added one right to enable OpenMP, but the create compiler flags are adding quite a bit. Uh, behind the scenes to make sort of everything sort of automatic and easy. 
And if I split this up and go through it, you can see that some of these are including the MPI libraries that are specific to our compiler and to our system. Um, it's also doing the same for the math and science libraries. You know, again, specific to our compiler and our system. Um, if you in, do, if you include uh, enable OpenMP, uh, it'll pick up that you're doing OpenMP and it'll use OpenMP in the in the math and science libraries that it links behind the scenes. Um, it's basically doing a lot of things that are very helpful for us. And the way you see that is with that dash create p dot verbose command. Um, now, so going back, like I said, I was typing capital CC to get our C++ compiler, right? But what I had loaded for my module was I had the, the new programming environment loaded. And that's why I got the G++ compiler. If instead, like in our other example, I had loaded the NVIDIA programming environment, and now I try to compile my same Hello World example again, the HP programming environment is smart enough to know that, oh, they want the MVC++ compiler, right? And not only do they want the MVC++ compiler, all those flags that I added for the GNU uh, G++ compiler, I'm going to change those to the equivalent versions for the NVIDIA compiler. So I get all the optimizations, all the other uh, libraries and specialty things, the math libraries, the MPI libraries, uh, LinkedIn, all those things that come with the other stuff also come with this one and all adjusted for you accordingly. So that's why we really recommend uh, using the compiler wrappers uh, when you compile your code. So this is one slide that's basically showing you the difference, the same thing, but between the programming environment Intel and programming environment I NVIDIA. This is a table which shows you like when you're picking different programming environments, which compilers you're getting. Um, Again, what I've been saying is that these the compiler wrappers will also link things like MPI, LAPAC, BLAST, Scalabac. Those are your math libraries. It will do it automatically for you. Uh, depending on what module is loaded, it will link what's needed there too. Uh, so it's very helpful. So in the last, uh, I guess I'm going to try to do some sort of more realistic examples real fast. Um, and Basically, what happens is we want to move up to larger, uh, larger code bases, right? So you've been doing, um, you know, single line comp compile code examples. We, most of the time, you probably want to find a code online, download the source code, and then compile it so that you can use it for your for your uh, code, right? Um, and so the question now becomes like, how do I get things set up to make that work? So um, I'm kind of, sorry, Charles, uh, I'm sort of running close to the end of time. How how much? You're, you're fine, keep going. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll adjust. OK. Um, so for the first example, what I want to show is how do I do this with the GNU Scientific Library? And so let's say I need this for my, my code to work. Uh, so I'm going to download it. and so. I'm going to show you how I do that. I'm going to go to this, the website where it's listed. I'm going to find the version I want. So let's just say the latest version. And I'm going to copy that link. And I could download it and then use SCP and transfer it and do that. But I can also just do this wget command. And that basically downloads it directly from the internet. So now I've got the file I need, right? But it's compressed. So I need to uncompress it. So I just use tar. And XVF is just. These are the flags I just always use. Um, they show like what is being expanded as it goes. Um, they do some other things. I'm sure if you wanted to know more, you would look by doing man and then tar or tar and then help. I'm sure they would tell us exactly what each one of those XPF flags did. Um, but I've used them same ones over and over again. So it's, uh, it's become such a habit now. I don't even think about it. OK. Uh, so I compress those files. I look in GSL 2.8, and I think, wow, that's a lot of stuff to deal with, right? Like if I had to compile each one of those single-handedly at a one at a time, it would take forever. So when you see a code like this, they've written a build system to do that for you automatically. 
And kind of what you're going to try to figure out is which build system are you working with? Um, there's probably two main ones now that I encounter is usually this auto tools and or auto conf. I know auto tools are the same one. Uh, and the other one is CMake. And I know that this one's going to be auto tools because I see um, a configure. I see like this AC local M4. I see make file AM. Like that tells me that this one's going to use uh, make files and, and whatnot. So when I see this, the first thing I want to do is run configure. Um, I'm going to also tell it where I want to install the files because usually by default, well, let's, let's figure this out together. Um, I'm going to do configure help. So it tells me all the options and then use less so that I can read it without it falling off the screen. But this is basically telling me all the options I can configure. And if you look here, this is where it's going to install. It's going to install by default into user local. On your own machine, you could do this, right? You have access to user local, but on Perlmutter, you don't. Um, so one of the things you're always going to want to do is change the installation prefix to something, to a place where you have control. Um, and for this example, I'm just going to put it, tack it onto the end. Um, but to do that, I like to copy where I'm at. And so now I'm going to do it this way. So I'm going to do configure. The prefix I'm going to give it is this whole long thing. And then I'm just going to add install VR at the end. Now it's going to do its configuration. So what it's doing now is it's checking the system uh, for various capabilities and settings. And now it's like designing a make file, which basically tells it how it wants to compile all the code in its uh, setup. Um, and it might take a, a minute or two uh, as it does this. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think it's almost there, though, if I remember correctly. So what we're what you're gonna end up seeing here is that running configure with the install directory as it is set up here, um, it found a compiler, but it didn't find the compiler wrappers. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to identify that when it's done here. So. After it's gone through its process, what you're going to see now is a make file. And the make file tells it how to compile its code. So if I go, if I go and look in this make file, I'm going to find lots of different things, right? About that's auto generated. So it's like this is why it doesn't look like a human wrote it, because a human didn't write it. It's all done by that configuration step. But if I know what I'm looking for. I can go down, I can search for CC and bounce around. And I see that it's set, it's C compiler to GCC, which is not the compiler wrapper, which means that it might work, but it's not going to run as well as it could. And it might not work <laughs> uh, on our system as very well uh, or at all. So what we really want this is to be CC. So to fix that, I have to go back to this configure step and I need to tell it it's explicitly to use the wrapper or the wrappers. So I need to include the CC, right? That's that that C compiler I wanted to use lowercase CC. For the C compiler, I wanted to use uppercase CC. And if you're doing any Fortran, I wanted to use FTN. Um just in case if you're doing FC 77 or the version of Fortran is also FTN. Now, once it goes through this configure process again, it's going to, um, <clears throat> we can inspect the make file and see that it should be, it will be using the right, uh, it'll be using the compiler wrappers so that we'll get all those optimizations, the correct MPI and features uh, set up from the beginning. And you're more likely to have things work and be performant out of the box that way. Um, Mm 
Excuse me for your first four tray on uh I believe you typed FTH instead of FDN. Oh, I missed it. I don't know if that'll cause an error here or not. Um hmm, that's a good question. Uh yeah, thank you for pointing out the typo. Um in this case it might not because I think this one is actually only using C code. I don't think it's compiling any Fortran code. Um however, in general, yeah, I think it's definitely better to get the right. <laughs> right things in the line. So I, I guess, um, uh, really, I feel like the configure step goes slower every time I run it. <sighs> The joys of compiling. Yeah, Charles, I may have to just do the last example of a separate video and tack it on at the end or something. Um, it's OK. I mean, this is good because now um, going into the running jobs, I can just speak to all of the slurm commands and points that you made. So this is okay. this works out perfect. Will you be covering containers in HPC environments? Uh, specifically, I was asking about uh, Aptainer. So we're going to talk about um, running jobs and containers. We have more detailed and advanced trainings focusing on some of our container environments. We previously used to include a small portion focusing on containers, but uh, it's we found it to be a little bit too advanced for some users. So we can we'll touch on it in running jobs, and we can point you to additional resources as well. Thank you. No problem. And also, we're going to schedule a new user's office hour for next week for follow-up questions uh, once uh, Lippy and Eric and I and the team determine a, a time next week. We will announce that to all attendees as well. OK. So now, if I look through my MIG file, I'm going to see. My CC has become lowercase CC, which is what I wanted. So now when I type make, and I'm I'm on a I'm on a node, so I'm gonna use a lot of jobs <laughs> um, to make this go faster. But now what you're gonna see as these fly by is the, this is the compile line that's gonna use for each of these codes, and it's gonna be CC instead of GCC, which tells us it's now using the compiler wrappers that we want, and we're getting all those optimizations and other things that we need for our system. Um, so essentially, I would wait for this for finish. I've done this a few times, and it usually finishes without any problem. Uh, and then the next step is to type, uh, after I do this, is to type make install so that it will install it into the install directory I specified earlier. Uh, and then that will kind of conclude uh, sort of the uh, example of how to install, you know, grab something off the internet, compile it, and install it uh, for your own use. Um, Charles, I can stop here. I know I'm going way over time now, so okay. Uh, I think this is probably good. All right, lots of useful information. I'm sure everyone found it very helpful. Okay, thank you, everyone, for your attention. <laughs>